Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, May 31st. Can't believe we're already moving into June. We will be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 22. We're in the chapter, the story of Avraham offering up, or being willing, I should say, to offer up his son Yitzhak in sacrifice, even though this is the son of promise. This is the son that through him, the Messiah is to come. This is Avraham's heart. It would, I'm sure, have been easier in Avraham's mind to cut his own heart out than to come uh, with the intent of sacrificing his son. We looked at last week as they were traveling together. We came to the point father and son are climbing the hill, Mount Moriah, together. Um, that reminds me, did I show last week? I did show last week that Mount Moriah and Golgotha are part of the same. All of a sudden I was thinking, uh-oh, I was supposed to do that now. <laughs> Anyways, he was going up that, they were traveling up that pathway together. Um, Yitzhak is carrying the wood for the sacrifice. Avram has the flame, the fire for the sacrifice. Might have been a, a pan of hot embers. We don't know exactly what it was like. But Yitzhak is realizing and says, hey, Dad, I see the fire, I see the wood, where's the sacrifice? And that sentence that came out of Abraham, that God himself will provide a lamb. It could be also said God will provide himself a lamb, that he will provide and he'll provide himself. Both are there in the Hebrews, a beautiful picture for us, a portrayal, because as we see father and son in total agreement, as we see that Yitzhak does not resist, that he willingly is going to lay down his life, we know that the father didn't stop. We know that the son didn't almost get sacrificed. We know it's the picture of Messiah giving his life completely for us, that he did die on the cross as the sacrificed Lamb of God, and hallelujah, raised from that dead brought back to life, even as Abraham believed God would do with Yitzhak if he did take his life. He had said prophetically to the, his servants that were with him on part of the journey, they were to stay here and we will come back to you. Abraham said it in the positive, not that I would come back, but we. So we see all the way the faith, the love, and we saw that this is the first time love is mentioned in scripture. When Abraham was asked to, to give his son, his only son, whom you love. And what better portrayal of love than the love of Jehovah, God the Father, and Yeshua, the Son of God, in the perfect sacrifice for us. So, here they go, though. We've got to see it in all its glory. Um, I'll just say, also in that provision, that, and I said it last week, but I love it, that God provided God. When there was this need, there's no other way to put it. God provided God. Not an angel, not a mere man, not the person that you think it is the greatest, because that person's still just a human, but God provided himself. That is amazing. He told um, Abraham to go to a certain place. He was leading Abraham. Verse 9, and then they came to the place of which God had told him. So see, God's still directing him. God had told him to go. He told him to go to Mount Moriah, which there's hills and mountains. God was telling him to go to a specific place. So God's continually having conversation with Abraham. When Abraham knew he was at the actual place where he was supposed to uh, offer up Yitzhak, this is where we're at. Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood bound his son Yitzhak Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Just simply put, but wow, what we're reading. Uh, again, that God has manifested himself and directed him. We see Abraham's 100% total obedience. The altar was probably made out of the stones of that area. It's a very stony area. And then he just simply says he bound Yitzhak. He bound Isaac. We don't see any rebellion. We don't see any surprise on Yitzhak's part. At some point between when Abraham answered his son and said God would provide, he had to have told his son, this is what God's asking me to do. And we see nothing but total compliance. Remember, Yitzhak is probably in his 30s. He's definitely not a child. And he's not an old man. Abraham is. Abraham, if Yitzhak is 30, that would make Abraham 130. 
He could easily overpower his father. He could easily say, you're Meshuggah, you've lost it, and you're praying, I'm not you know, going to be a party to this. He could have run off. Any number of scenarios, but we don't see that at all. We just have a willingness to follow along with the Father's plan. Uh, again, it's a type of Messiah for us, of Yeshua Jesus, who's called the Son of God, who said, I've come to do the will of my Father. We know that he came to die. He didn't resist. He didn't fight it. We see that the agony the night before in Gethsemane was over his becoming that sin offering. But he was yielding even that, saying, not my will, but yours be done. We see when they nailed him to the cross that the others fought, but he did not. He willingly laid down his life. He was submissive and obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We read that in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Uh, you can read it later on your own, but it simply tells us that even though Yeshua was equal with God, he had no reason to be subservient, had no reason to take on this kind of a being this kind of a sacrifice, not because he deserved it, but because out of his heart of love, he was willing to be uh, that sacrifice, willing to be obedient. So uh, this is a remarkable picture of the Lord. We see him, we're only in chapter 22. We've just barely begun this book. And I don't mean bare sheep, I mean the Bible, the Word of God. And we already have thousands of years before it's going to happen. Such a beautiful picture. The Son of Promise willingly sacrificing in obedience to his Father. And even, you can take it even to the detail, when Yitzhak carried the wood up for, for the, the, the altar, we can see Yeshua carrying the wooden cross that he was nailed to also. Both, I think, did it in the full confidence of the promise of resurrection. Yeshua knew God's eternal plan. He was not lost and wondering what was going on. He knew he was going to die, but he also knew he was going to be resurrected. I think Yitzhak had to come into the faith of his father and had to have agreed with his father you're right, Dad. I am the son of promise. I am your only son. God has said this will come through me. He must be, whatever he has to do on the other end, he will do it. So I think that he had an inkling. They didn't have an understanding that we can have looking back and seeing a, a whole picture, seeing it done. But the same way Abraham stepped out in faith when he saw the gospel given to him in the stars, he looked forward to that day. They did not fully understand, but they did see what God had promised. Yes. I think Abraham, uh, Abraham, <laughs> uh, I, I think see. he uh, really uh, trained his son as he's growing up. Yes. So if he knew of his God, yes, he absolutely, knew God could do all things. So he didn't have fear or worry. Whatever Dad's going to do, he knows what's best. He and, didn't question God. And he felt the same, that God was in control, not mm -hmm. his father doing something crazy, mm -hmm. but that God was in control. I absolutely agree. I don't think it could have been an overnight. He had to have been walking with the Lord also. He had mm -hmm. to been, uh, have that relationship with the Lord. And so that's what we're seeing act in action here. And as we read 9 and verse 10 also, which I'll read in a moment, we're going to see a picture of the sinner in the place of death. We're bound by the cords of sin. That's like when Isaac was laid on the altar and he was bound. We're unable to help ourselves. He was unable to help himself at that point. And then we see the knife. That knife would be divine justice. We all, the wages of sin is death. We deserve the knife. We deserve to have that the life taken from us in the consequence of our sins. Yet it's suspended over because God's going to step in. Wow. Is it uh, the reason they uh, uh, bind them? Is it because uh, they're bound from sin and that represents the bounding? For us, it's a picture of we're bound by sin. That sin has, oh. has bound oh. us. They would bind the sacrifice so that the animal wouldn't struggle and kick and fight. Because then it could not it end up not being a merciful death. It could end up being a suffering death. So they they were just bound to keep them from the, any kind of struggle or fight. Yitzhak, it wasn't because of that, because he was willingly. But it is a picture of us. We're bound by our sin. We can't break those cords of sin off of us. But he can, and he does. 
and let's look at the picture. That's uh, a good explanation. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Yeah, it is. It, it just really brings it to life for us, doesn't it? Yeah. And let's look at that because verse 10 tells us, Abraham reached out with his hand, took the knife to slaughter his son. And I'm glad they use the word slaughter there because th that makes you think of the sacrifice of the lamb again. This is what was yeah. taking place. So he's lifted that knife. He's ready. We're going to pause right there before we hit verse 11. And we're going to see that knife does speak of the execution of judgment. That's what would be coming on him. How do we see this picture that we've just drawn in other scripture? Because we use scripture to understand scripture and to see our full picture and to know that we are right. And I will say, let's look at Isaiah 53. Yeshaya chapter 53. Um, I don't think there can be a, a stronger picture. Um, if you've been with me long enough, you, you've heard Isaiah 53, at least parts in many different ways and many different times. Right now, let's focus on verse 4. It says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken. Okay, we see him stricken, but notice the next, smitten of God and afflicted. What verse? Verse 4. So he's bearing our griefs, he's bearing our sorrows, he's bearing our sins. We've seen him stricken and smitten and Isaiah is saying, by God. Look at verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. And then it goes on from there. We see that the Father is the one bringing the death to the Son. What chapter? Isaiah 53. Okay. Okay, it's in your cross-references. Because we're going to move on to Romans 8.32. I want you to see the whole picture. This is a hard concept for us to understand. But it was out of the Father's love. It's not out of vengeance. It's not out of um, anger or anything like that. This is out of love that, that this is being carried out in this way. Romans 8.32 says, He, God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? If the Father gave us the Son in this picture of, of sacrificial death, what more could he do? Even being God, what more could he do? There's nothing greater than giving his Son in our step. That's what's being said. God the Father planned this. It wasn't accidental. God the Son, can I say agreed to it? It's not like he didn't come up with the concept himself also because they're, they're both one and the same. But this is amazing, amazing love that this would be the plan. Summed up so well in John 3, 16, Yochanan 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, that's his only precious son, the son, your only son, the one whom you love. This is who God the Father gave, that any who would believe would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Wow, that's love. There's no greater picture. Yeshua said no greater love has one than he lays down his life for his friends. But this goes so far that God laid down his son's life, his son willingly giving it, even for those who were at enmity with God, because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amazing, amazing. Now, since I mentioned, John, I didn't take you there, but I took you to Romans close enough, stop off on your way back and look with me at John 8. Uh, we've looked at this before, but I think it's good to bring it out again and reinforce it. Uh, Yochanan 8, verse 56, John 8, and verse 56. And here we read, Yeshua is talking to the Pharisees. They're, they're, they're arguing with him. <laughs> and he, and the, the Jewish audience around him also. Remember, he was in his flesh, he was Jewish. He was in a Jewish neighborhood, shall I put it that way? And he says to these people, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Well, the Jews scoffed at that and they said, What? You're saying, Abraham saw you, yeah, uh, yeah he's uh, how many thousand years old now, and 
he saw you, you know, they couldn't understand it and they just scoffed at it that, that you know, he's out of his mind. But how was, what was Yeshua Jesus referring to when he said, Abraham saw my day? He rejoiced and was glad in it. Mm -hmm. I believe it was right here, right now in this picture. He had heard about the gospel in the stars. He had been told and he had an idea in his mind, which was right. But I think it really came home in 3D color. So I put it that way. You know, we understand that the more we learn, the more we understand. And when he's going through this motion and with the way that the day ends and the whole picture that's brought to them, because we're only in the middle of the picture now, I think that easy is the day. It could have been the day that he looked at the gospel and the stars and God told him. It could be that day also. I won't argue it either one. He caught the idea. He caught the vision. He knew the truth. There is one coming who will take away the sins of the world. But I think it easily could be that this very day, Abraham and Yitzhak both realized, wow, what a portrayal of what's going to happen down the road. I, I think they got it. I really do. Um, what we're going to see at this point, though, when we go back to Genesis and we're going back there right now, is going to be a slight... Uh, Okay, I can't use, I can't say it that way. It's going to be where the picture doesn't quite measure up because Abraham doesn't uh, kill Isaac. Isaac isn't resurrected. I want to make that very clear. I think you all know that. So our picture falls just slightly short of the perfect picture that it's trying to show us. But what God's even going to show Abraham in that is remember we talked last week about Abraham had been around pagan idolatry. He'd been around the gods that others worship. He had seen or at least heard of human sacrifice. That wasn't a strange, total, you know, never heard of this in my life thought. Uh, he saw the Canaanites. He saw many others who demanded human sacrifice. But he's going to see upfront and personal God was never pleased with human sacrifice. He was not requiring that. He strongly and he clearly demonstrates he did not want human sacrifice. He wanted Abraham to show to Abraham his own heart. Are you willing to give me the thing most precious to you and what, what has all your hope, all your future, everything in it? But he never intended for Abraham to sacrifice Yitzhak. This was a test for Abraham to see. Remember he told him, offer him. Well, Abraham offered Yitzhak without putting the knife to his throat. He 100% offered him. He took it right up to the point and was even willing and ready to, to take that knife to his son. And this is where God clearly steps in and changes the picture. We talked about last week how God does not and never wanted human sacrifice. So we won't say any more of that now. But here's where our picture takes another wow dimension. We come into the, the next phrase in verse 11. He's already, he's, he's got the knife in his hand. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Okay, I'll stop right there. The angel of the Lord. Who is that. Who yeah. is the angel of the yeah. Lord? Okay, Jesus. Gabriel's one suggestion. Jesus. Jesus is another suggestion. The Lord. The Lord is another. Some will say God. Who is it? Who is the angel of the Lord? Well, let's look real close at our chapter and then let's look at a few other things and let's decide who this is. First of all, if I read through, and I'm going to come back and break it all down, but let me read through what happens in, the, in verses 11 and 12. So he's, the, Lord's, the angel of the Lord's called out from heaven and said, Avram, Avram. And he said, Hineni, here I am, here I am. And then the voice out of heaven, he said, do not reach out your hand against the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, he works, from me. Now God's speaking. And he's saying, you've not withheld your son from me. So the but angel Jesus of the Lord. Born yet. What? Jesus was not born yet. So it cannot okay. be a son. Okay, the only way it could be is if it's a picture of, like, the, the spirit. we mm -hmm. say 
the word you commonly hear is theophany. That's a picture of God in a form that we can relate to. When we see Daniel see God in his dream, he talks about his hair and his eyes and his hands, and yet we know God is a spirit. He's not bound by the human form, but he was seen in that to help Daniel, Daniel at the time. When we see Yeshua Jesus before he had a human body, it's the same way. So while I totally agree with everything Dora said, we'll still say, okay, well then are we looking at the angel of the Lord being God or being Yeshua, Jesus? Which one are we seeing? Oh, and you Jesus. know my great answer? I, I yes. <laughs> my great answer is yes. We're seeing God and we're seeing Yeshua, Jesus. Remember the two are one. And in some way that we cannot fathom and fully understand, we separate them, but they're one. Mm -hmm. We separate them to a third point when we add in the Ruach HaKodesh, but they're one. Can I get that? No. Honestly, I can't. The closest I can get is a man can be a father, a son, and a brother all at the same time, but they're one man. Mm -hmm. But it still falls short because when they're the father, they're the father. When they're the brother, they're the brother. When they're the son, they're the son. They're not, you know, it's not all equal. But for our God, he is. So we know that this has to be God because it's God speaking. But I'm going to show you also how it has to be the son because of the son's involvement in here. So as we go on, just let your mind try to go beyond the human mind. But both are right. Um, and again, yes, Yeshua didn't have a body yet, so it's not the body, but a picture of. It's also God who took on a form to help us see and relate and understand. But his spirit was with God, too, so he was part of God. Yes. His spirit. Yes. Yes. And if it was a, a normal angel like Gabriel, or someone that God got set down, it would be you withheld, you didn't withhold your son from God. You did, God said, you help with help from me. Right, no. right. That from me is key. That tells us we know God's speaking, so we know he's saying it to himself. That knocks out Gabriel, Michael, any of the angels who hold a higher position. And here is where we also will see in Scripture, Malach Adonai or Malach Yehovah. Both are translated the angel of the Lord. Now, Malach is your word angel. Adonai recognizes Lord. And sometimes when it says Jehovah, we think of Jehovah as the name of the Father more than we do the Son, even though, again, their names are interchangeable. Remember, go to Revelation 1. Read that description, and you'll start out and you'll say, oh, that's God the Father. That's God the Father. Wait a minute, now that's God the Son. That's God. Oh, wait a minute, now we've got the Father. Now we've got the Son. And by the time you get done with that description, you have to say yes. <laughs> it's both. You have to say yes. Um, when when we see Malach from the root word from the Hebrew, it means to send. Okay, well, who was the sent one? Yeshua, the son. So in that way, we would say Malach Adonai would be Yeshua. It would be the sent one. But we also see at the same time, he's the one who sends. So again, we're trying to comprehend what's incomprehensible to a human finite mind. But we do know God did create angels. He sent them with messages at different times. We know that. But this one, and actually, um, I, I, yeah, I didn't misspeak. Malach is very close to Melech. It only is the vowel soundings that are different. Melech is king. And we know Yeshua is king of kings, Lord of lords. I'm going to say he's the angel of the angels. You know, he's that top position that everything else is underneath. Um, it's the angel of the Lord that has the capacity to say. As soon as you say that, it has to be God the Father, God the Son. Because a normal angel does not have capacity to say. Only salvation comes only from Yeshua. Jesus has shed blood, and he being the representative of God, who he came in the, 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 the Spirit of God to do the will of God. Okay, so... This supreme message then, we could say, is literally from Elohim, from God himself. Because God's, Yeshua is speaking out loud what God said when he said, I, I came to do the will of the Father. In that same way, we're hearing 
Jehovah the Father from heaven say, you haven't withheld your son from me, but at the same time, we know that this one is a picture of Yeshua, the son who is willing to give his life. So in that way, once again, we're seeing it's a picture of both of them. We can't separate it. The angel of the Lord appears to Moshe, Moses at the burning bush. He uh, shows up um, Gideon when he's going to fight the Midianites. Uh, there are many different times in scripture. I think there's over 50 times the angel of the Lord shows up. And this is something we even use with our Jewish people when we try to talk and share with them. Who's the angel of the Lord? And as they're led into it, if they'll go into that study with you, the answer comes totally and completely to us, God the Father, who presented himself in God the Son, who took on that human flesh, who came to earth, and is the Shekinah glory of our God, expressed in that human image, because at the same time he was fully God. So, even when we look at the Hebrew, we see room for both. Room for God the Father, room for God the Son to be both of them using that title interchangeably. So only in the context of the moment where we know God speaking out from heaven, we know that, that we have talked about it being Jehovah that's been talking with um, Abraham all along, but now we see it in such a presentation, a picture of Yeshua, Jesus, that we cannot fully separate that anybody who answers either one I'll say you're you're fine you're right on because the angel Lord is speaking so if he's called the angel the Lord and he's not meant to be the Lord Jesus also then why didn't it say the angel of God but it doesn't the title given is angel the Lord because the Lord is God follow me as, as much as you can yeah yeah, as much as you can. I, I don't know that I can find a better way to explain it because, again, we're trying to understand something that really is beyond our comprehension. Yeah, when, you, but, when you get to the spirit part, it can be hard. You really have to have the Holy Spirit to really venture out there and to see where God is a spirit. His Son is of the Godhead and all that. Right, right. To fully understand it, yes. We've been introduced to this angel of the Lord. I'll get you in just a second, Maria. I see your hand. We've been introduced to this angel of the Lord earlier in Bereshit. He spoke to Hagar, remember? In chapter 16, verses 7 to 13, you can read again, when she ran and, and he even told her, you're pregnant. You know, remember, that was the angel of the Lord. We, see, we will see again in chapter 31. In fact, because we're going, we're in Genesis, let's, let's skip over real quick. Let's go to 31, and then we'll come right back and see in chapter 31 and verse 11, because this is sandwiched between the Genesis two. Thir Genesis 31? Genesis 31, yes. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Yaakov, Jacob, and he said, here am I. Now in 31, he is called angel of God. In in 22, he's called the angel of the Lord. Are we seeing a difference? When we get to 31 and we see who wrestled with Yaakov all night, we're going to have the same problem. Is it the father, is it the son, or is it one? It's one. It's both. So they're interchangeable in this way. And I don't think that we can slice it to the point to say one was and one wasn't. The angel of God, the angel of the Lord, we're expressing maybe one as God the Father, maybe one as God the Son, but as soon as you try to hold that formula, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to have to open it up and say, either one fits the description. Either one is the one that is speaking. Um, we're going to see also, I have compare it, and I don't even remember, chapter 28. Let me go there real quick because I don't remember. Uh, Genesis 28. And verse 13, this is when God's speaking to Yaakov also. Then behold, the Lord was standing above the ladder and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Yitzhak. Okay, so here he's going to call himself the Lord. Yet it's the same angel that's appearing to him in chapter 28, who's appearing to him in chapter 31, who appeared to Hagar in chapter 16, and who is with us here in chapter 22. So... Uh, all I can tell you is the angel of the Lord is, is God, the angel of the Lord is Yeshua. They are 
They are both. The title fits both of them. And I think our spirit has just come yes. into our house. <laughs> I'm going to close the door that came open by itself. <laughs> but we uh, let the wind come in, and the wind represents our spirit. And maybe it's God's spirit shining on us saying, don't try to understand it, little children. Just believe it. <laughs> All by faith. All by faith, yes. yes. So back to Genesis chapter 22. And we have the angel of the Lord speaking to him. Or, or I'm sorry, does it say, which one does it say yeah. at the beginning? Don't forget question. God speaking. What, what oh, Maria, I did forget you. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Maria? Back, back to 22. Oh, yeah, yeah verse. <clears throat> we just see uh, an ESV. And I, 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 when they are uh, uh, writing it in mind, it says, by the angel of the Lord in capital letters. Right. So to me, it tells me that that is... Uh, the second of the Trinity. Maybe I'm wrong. Usually that is the way that it is, but when you go back into the Hebrew and you'll see, you're again going to say Yahweh versus um, uh, Adonai. You know, they'll say, well, one's the Father and one's the Son, but as soon as you try to hold that all the way through, you're going to find it, there's, it, it, it interweaves. You can't just totally separate it. But yes, it's saying the angel of the Lord in the Hebrew right there, which is what I said in the beginning. But then remember, and let's, let me prove what I'm trying to say right here. Go up to verse 1. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him. So in verse 1, 22, Genesis 22. In verse 1, God is speaking. So in verse 11... God is speaking. We see that because verse 12 says, you haven't withheld your son from me. So God is speaking, God is speaking, but in the middle of that, we have him called the angel of the Lord, and it does use from the Hebrew the word that we usually identify with Yeshua Jesus. So see right there, you've got God the Father and God the Son intertwining. Interchangeable. And interchangeable, better word, better word, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So the angel of the Lord is God, and God is the angel of the Lord, who is Yeshua. One question. And God has the power to do, to do it. <laughs> to do it. To do it. If we put him on our level, then God's only as good as, as the best human. <laughs> and thank God that's not true. <laughs> Where would we be if that was true? Roger. Do you think he saw the angel or just heard from the angel? Did he see him or just hear him? I think because it says that he called to him from heaven. So I'm going to say he heard him. Okay. You know, and his response was, hear my. But I, I think we just he just heard him. That's a powerful voice from heaven. <laughs> yes. And it's that same powerful voice from heaven that Shaul Paul heard in his unsaved state that knocked him off his high horse, got his full attention. He was blinded for a time, but... He came to see. He came to see the truth. So, but it is. It's a fascinating study. But the angel of the Lord has to be the Lord himself, personified as father or as son. Hey, I think I just put it in one sentence. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back in here, we've got the angel Lord called him from heaven and said, oops, I'm reading 11. And he already answered Hanani then. He said, Verse 12, did it, was I ready for that? Yes, I was ready for that. He said, do not reach out your hand against the boy. Remember the word for boy does not mean a little child. That's where we get those pictures that are, you know, misrepresenting. But that word boy goes all the way up to one who gets married. And we even see it used in the same context that a 70-year-old mom refers to her 50-year-old son as my boy, my son, my kid, you know. That, that's not a word that means that, that he was, you know, be preteen or anything like that. So, um, now I know, sorry, I keep losing my thought because i got so much spinning, um, that you, okay. Do not reach out your hand against the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Okay, now I know. Did God not know? No, that's not what he's meaning, but he's revealing the whole picture. I know, and Abraham now, you also know. Our faith is always proven or disproven by our actions. 
If it's genuine faith, we will follow through in our, in our faith. But if you take away that faith from Abraham, if he's willing to, to sacrifice his son for anything less than his faith, then he is a madman. He is a murderer. There is no other reason for this picture except faith. <clears throat> that kind of faith that's willing to say, God, I don't get you. I don't understand you, but I know this is what you're saying to do, and I know even if there are dire consequences from taking this action, you will also deal with those dire consequences because you are God and you can and you will. And that's what we see with Abraham. That's why it says that he feared God. He didn't do it because he was afraid God was going to club him. It doesn't mean that kind of fear. It means he reverenced him, he respected him, he put him in that sovereign position. God, you get to call the shots. I'm not going to obey just because I understand. I'm not going to obey just because I agree. I am going to obey because you are God and I am yours. And whatever you are leading me into is what is best, what is right, and what is truth. Because you cannot do anything less than that. God cannot lie to us. God cannot mislead us. God doesn't do something and then pull, yank the, the, the chain or, or dangle the carrot. That's not who our God is. But in this, we saw Abraham reverence God. We saw that this is a reverential trust in God. This also includes, when we look at the whole picture of our faith, this includes a hating what's evil. It's, it's not just winking at it is hating it we should hate everything that's evil we should have such reverence for our sovereign god we should have such trust for him we should implicitly and completely 100 percent obey him without question without saying how come or why or but this is a complete god you are nothing but good you are truth you are light you are justice you are who i follow no matter what. And this is what we see that Abraham did. He lived out his faith 100% completely. This is why he is called the man of faith. Why God spoke about his faith and put him in the hall of faith chapter. Not hall of fame, but hall of faith chapter. And once again, I'll remind you, this supreme test of Abraham's faith did not come suddenly. God has been testing him and bringing him and growing him and preparing him. God's not going to ask a baby to do something only an adult can do. When you're a baby in the Lord, your tests are going to be equal to being a baby. They're not going to be man-sized uh, tests. But if you, if you stay there, how disgraceful. And I don't mean for ones who, who did not develop properly. But in the Lord, a 50-year-old baby, really? Really? You need someone to give you a bottle and you're 50 years old? You need them to change your diapers? You need them to take care of you and cuddle you and do all the things that a, a mama does to a baby? For shame. If you even saw a 10-year-old being treated like that by the parent, and there's no reason. Again, I'm not, I'm not talking about those who developly are challenged. But there's no reason for it. It would be a disgrace to even see a 10-year-old. We do God a disgrace if we can say, why well, I, I accepted him into my heart 40 years ago, and your walk isn't showing that of a mature adult. Shame on you if it's not. This is what we should be doing through all our tests and trials is growing and growing and growing. Abraham was tested with Ishmael before he was tested with Yitzhak. God grows us up. He gets us prepared. He makes us ready. The same way you as a good parent sent your child to kindergarten so that they could go to elementary, so that they could go to junior high, so that they could go to high school, so that one day they could even go to college. You didn't send them to college at five years of age, and you didn't skip all that in between and send them to college without giving them the foundation and the growth. This is what our God's done. He's done a mighty work in Abraham, and Abraham is showing it. God knows how to prepare you for your test. So the next time you're shrinking back saying, I can't do this test, Lord. <laughs> Walk your faith. 
and see what the Lord will do in you and through you. It's easy to be committed to God when everything's going right. It's easy to show up and follow along, but when those days are hard, when there is confusion, when there is lack of understanding, what are you going to do? Step back and say, you know what, God? Abraham couldn't know what you were doing when you were telling him to give up his son, and he went the whole way. Let me walk in the faith that I see in my father Abraham. Mm -hmm and trust you and know the outcome will be good. That's what God wants from us. That's what we can learn from this. Loretta? You know, what's really a, a wonder is if a person takes that long to grow, it makes you wonder if they're really saved. If they have that love, that desire to want to grow, you're going to want to grow and read. But if you don't do it, if you don't read and pray, how can you grow and then you can't you wonder about it? You can't. That. You have to take those steps to grow. And that's why we thankfully aren't the judge of the heart. But like someone said, we can be fruit inspectors. No, you know, are they showing the fruits? <laughs> if they're not, pray for their salvation. If they are, pray that they grow. That's but, what yes. I did my son. Yes. Right? And, <laughs> and we all see immature people. We see mm -hmm. those who take the shortcuts and the easy ways out and they don't want to grow and they don't want to apply themselves. And, you know, I, I even, and this is not meant in a negative way, but I even heard it in my family and the kids said it jokingly, but they were trying to make a decision. I don't remember what it was. So this was just in the last week. But the one looked at the other and said, we need an adult here. <laughs> they were both saying they didn't want to step up to the plate as adults, but they both knew this is what we need to do. Yes, we have to exercise it because human nature shrinks back. Human nature doesn't want to fully submit. Human nature doesn't want to spend that time in those things that will help us grow. Tell me a four-year-old that you put down in front of them a very balanced dinner very balanced vegetables and you know everything they need and then put down a chocolate cake and say you can have either one you want for dinner what's the four-year-old gonna do okay. <laughs> straight for the cake yeah <laughs> you know we have to grow that four-year-old as, as they grow maybe they eat the cake that night and they get a stomach ache and the next time they're offered those two it's like you know that's not the wisest decision see they're learning they're growing but really, our trials show what's in our heart. Our trials show whether we're fully committed, partially committed, not at all committed. And I'm not here to judge. That's between you and the Lord. Okay? I think that we're talking a bit like what James was trying to teach us. Let's go look at James chapter 2. And Where? James. James. Whoops. Oh, James. Okay, come on. There we go. Oh. Yeah, just don't hit the wrong button on your tablet or it takes you a hundred attempts to get back to the right one. <laughs> Which will give you all time to get to James before me. So mm -hmm. James chapter 2 and we're going to look at several verses. We're going to start with verse 17. James, in Hebrew it sounds like Yaakov, it's close to Jacob. It's just, it, it's very related. Uh, chapter 2 verse 17 we read here, Even so faith if it has no works, is dead being by itself. Now this will step in where Loretta is saying, if, you, if someone professes that they have Jesus in their heart, but they show no hunger, they don't want to study his word, they don't want to pray, they don't want to fellowship with other believers, they don't want to take the steps to grow, do they really have genuine faith? This is, this is the question. When we get down, let's look at verse 20. But are you willing to recognize you foolish fellow? that faith without works is useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, Yitzhak, his son, on the altar? He's talking about exactly the chapter we're in right now. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So when we read all of that, and even down to verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. As soon as we read all that, if you don't understand that in context, you have those who say, you have to work for your salvation. That's not what James is saying. Uh, that's what I was going to bring up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Did you want to say or just question? Well, because it says you're not supposed to work for your salvation, and here it says without work 
It's useless. Faith without the work is useless. Because what it's saying is you get saved by faith. In fact, let me answer it with and stay right here on track. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 because Ephesians gives us the order. You get saved by your faith. It's an act of your faith. It's not your works. You don't earn it. You don't do this and do this and do that, do all the right things, get brownie points, suddenly now you're saved. Okay? Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace... You've been saved through faith. Grace, unmerited, undeserved favor. That's what grace means. By grace, you are saved through faith. Not of yourselves. You didn't do it. It's a gift of God. Not a result of works. So no one can boast. I earned my salvation sooner than you did. I earned my salvation better than you did. Nobody can do any of that. For we are his workmanship, this is verse 10 now, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, that's in Messiah Yeshua, for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The works follow the faith. The works aren't the faith. The works don't equal the faith. But when you have faith, then you'll work out in your faith. The easiest way I can say, and I've given the example before, when you ask Jesus into your heart, you, it's as if that you were given, I'm going to call it a mine. You are given the, the deed to a mine. The mine is yours. That mine is salvation. Salvation is yours. God wrote on the front of the mine, Rochelle's mine. Okay. Now, I have that. If I never do anything with that mine, it's still mine. But if I want the benefit of that mine, if I care about that mine, if I care about my salvation at all, I'm going to want to work out my salvation. I'm going to want to get in there. Let me go in and explore what, what do I have in this mine. And if I even start digging, I'm going to bring out jewels. Who knows what I'll find? It might be a gold mine. It might be a silver mine. It might have all kinds of precious jewels. It's going to definitely have nuggets of something. That's also mine. But if I never exercise that, I never start working it out, I don't benefit from that. I have the salvation, but I don't have anything more. Anyone who has salvation is going to want to find out what I have, want to exercise what I have. They're going to want to start, and that start is going to ignite in works. So Abraham had faith in God. We know he got that when he saw the gospel in the stars. God said, I counted it to him for righteousness. He didn't become righteous after he offered Isaac. This could almost sound like that in James. But, God, but James is trying to say because he was righteous, because he had faith, he was able to do this test that proved his righteousness. That's what we're being told. We see the proof of our salvation by what we do with it. But the thief on the cross never had a chance. He got the mine. He got his name put on the mine of salvation. That was it because he was taken into heaven. Well, he was taken into the heart of the earth, heaven shortly. But right, you know, hours after he accepted the Lord in faith. But those of us who are alive have that opportunity. Wow, I'm saved. What does that mean? What can I do? I want to thank my God. I want to please my God. I want to live unto my God. And you'll start growing. You'll start working out your faith. So you work out, not work for. Key it's words. more like, like obedience. When God speaks to you, you do what God asks you to do instead of yes. not so much work in the word. Work. Yes. Suddenly, you're not on the throne now. God's on the throne. What does he want? What does he ask me to do? How can I please him? How can I be more like him? And he'll lead you in all the baby steps. He will spoon feed you. He will bottle feed you initially. But he wants you to grow where now you can begin to, ah, I, I, I'm toddling. I can fall easily, but I'm toddling. And he'll have his hand right there to hold you when you're ready to fall. And he'll keep growing you and keep growing you. And also when you work out, uh, there's a gift of the Spirit. So you're working with your faith in the spirit of the ram being a fruit inspector. 
not going out there and trying to prove you're working like the job of witnesses. They are still trying to work their way to heaven also. They yeah, still they think so. that you got to do to get. Salvation and growing in the, but, the gifts and the spirit and do things to grow in the Lord. And let's put it this and way. Faith produces works. Yeah, Faith is isn't dead. Yeah. Faith produces works. So if you don't see works follow, then you can question whether the faith is true. You do not question to judge them. It's not our place, it's God's place only. But if you are in their lives to disciple them, to grow them, to help bring them along the way, the path uh, that they're on now, then yes, you can be inspecting and if you see a concern, you know, I don't know that there's genuine faith here. Or maybe someone's brought into your life because we have a lot of people, sadly, who think that they are saved. If you ask them, are you a Christian, they'll say, yes, I'm a Christian. Now, ask them the next question. On what basis are you a Christian? Oh, well, I was born in the United States. Oh, I go to church. Oh, because you go to church, you're a Christian. Does that mean if you're born in the garage, you're a car? Or a Sunday school teacher? Yeah, or I'm even a Sunday school teacher. You know, There's all kinds of reasons. If they say anything besides Jesus, he saved me then they're not saved. That's the only way for salvation. Then their life should start showing it. But you may be brought into their life even to help them understand that. Salvation isn't because you were born in the right place or because you give God an hour or maybe you give him a whole two hours, three hours. No, it's, it's accepting Jesus as your savior, knowing you are a sinner, that you have a consequence called death that he's going to spare you from by giving you eternal life with him. But because you've received that now, that faith is going to ignite everything within you because yes, the spirit gives you, the, he indwells you what gift number one, major gift, and then he infuses in you other gifts for you to use in your growth, in your walk, that will be a blessing to you and to those around you and we all grow together. But. Uh, <clears throat> It definitely, if you ever get confused on the formula, go to Ephesians. You're saved by grace. You're saved to do good works for the Lord. Not the other way around. You don't do good works and then you're saved. You're saved to do good works. You, you can tell if a curse is grown by the joy they carry and how they pray. If other people can see your light. You can't miss the truth. You can't miss the truth. You can wonder about someone who's not showing, but you can't miss the truth. So back into our Genesis. Hopefully these are good lessons for all of us, uh, either in our walk or, um, or for those that are in our lives. And I'll tell anyone, if you're feeling any prick in your heart and any concern of whether you are genuinely saved, open up your heart and say, if I've never received you, I think of a, a girl that went to Christian school with me. She had been, she was much older, a number of years older than I. She'd been in a family, she'd been in church all her life. She genuinely thought she was a Christian. The school brought in a spiritual emphasis week, brought in an evangelistic speaker, and as he was speaking and speaking salvation, she felt in her heart and she thought, why am I feeling this? I'm saved. And the Lord got through to her and said, are you? Have you ever opened your heart to me and asked me to come in and be your savior? Or have you just claimed it because you've been in the midst of all of this, but you've never personally done it? And she realized, wow, I never have personally accepted. I've played the game. I walked the walk and talked the talk, but I never started from point one where I have to, where everybody has to start. She opened up her heart, gave her heart to the Lord, and we all saw the transformation in her. She was just beaming for the Lord, and she was out and out for the Lord where we all thought she had been saved because she was going along with the waves. If you've been going along with the waves, you've been surrounded in a good atmosphere, still, you've got to make it personal. If you never have, you open your heart and you say, I need you as Savior. I'm a sinner. I need my sins forgiven. I ask you to come into my heart in that capacity. Now, once you've done that, don't ever say, call God a liar and say, well, I need to do that again. I, I'm not sure God did it. 
God isn't a liar. He says, you open your heart, I come in. He is yours and he is with you forever. Hallelujah. Forever. <laughs> so all those works, those aren't earning you anything except rewards in heaven to give back to the Lord in glory to him. Abraham is being taught to by our God, our Father, our Messiah and Savior, all in one. And we are in still in verse 12, and he said, You've not withheld your son. The same word when we read Romans 8, God spared not himself by giving his son. It's the same word when the Septuagint that took our Hebrew scriptures and translated it into Greek for the Greek speakers of that day, they used the same word. So in essence, when he's saying you've not spared yourself, you, that you were willing to give your all just as the Lord God, he spared not himself, he gave himself. God did what Abraham was willing to do, but God did. He didn't spare himself. He gave his son, as we said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I saw a shirt recently that said, I'm a whosoever. <laughs> I loved it. I thought that's a good one. <laughs> I'm a whosoever. Put your name in there. So looking at this now, Abraham has been stopped. God has told him, I see your heart. Abraham knows his heart. He knows he withheld nothing. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't hold on to the corner and not let go. He was willing to give it all. And uh, God didn't let him give it all. He stops him short, and he tells him, don't reach out, don't t touch the son. Um, then, verse 13, then Abraham raised his eyes, and he looked. You know, he's focused on the son and, and ready to sacrifice, but suddenly something catches his attention, and he raises his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Okay, let me break that down before we go too far. The ram is going to be the substitute. We all know the story. That's a type of Messiah, of Christ being our substitute. The ram's going to come take Yitzhak's place. Yeshua comes and takes our place because we're the ones that need to die for our sins. Yitzhak, Yitzhak was not the son to be offered. He was only a type of the Son, and I'm putting that by capital letters, the capital, capital S, the Son. The Son of God is the one who would be offered, but Yitzhak couldn't be offered because he wasn't that Son. He was just a picture, okay? The ram, which is a fully grown male sheep, because Messiah was fully grown, he's in his manhood, when he is the sacrificed <laughs> Lamb of God, when he was crucified. So the ram is the perfect picture of the Lamb of God, the perfect picture of Yeshua, Jesus. That ram was caught. He was entangled in the thicket. That's a thicket of thorns. How appropriate. The ram is caught in the thorns, and we see Yeshua mm -hmm. wear a crown of thorns on his head for us. Let me show you what the thorns represent. Go with me back to Bereshit chapter 3. Long time ago we were here. Genesis chapter 3 verse 17. And here we read, Then to Adam God said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, you've eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from the tree. Cursed is the ground because of you. With hard labor, you'll eat from it all the days of your life, verse 18. But thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. You shall eat the plants of the field, and that goes on. So thorns and thistles come out of the cursed ground because of Adam's sin. The thorns were a result of sin. They weren't there, apparently, before, or at least they didn't harm, they didn't hurt, before the curse. So the thorns are a picture of the curse, and we see Yeshua wearing the curse when he was removing it for us. What verse was that? In Genesis 3, 17 and 18. 17 and 18. 17 and 18, yes. Yeah. So Yeshua wore a crown of thorns because he bore the curse of our sin, 
the ram caught in the thicket of thorns is a picture of Jesus, of Yeshua, taking the curse for us, taking that, wow, I mean, right down to the detail, God put everything into this picture. Back to chapter 22, um, do I want to say this? Let me see, did I finish our verse? Okay, um, they saw the ram that was caught, no, I didn't finish it. A ram that was caught in the thicket by its horns, and Aram went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And the burnt offering is an offering for sin, all of it given unto the Lord. He did it all. He took it all. Now, one interesting note, we don't read of Abraham ever building another altar to the Lord. This was the ultimate one. We've had altar and altar and altar at different times, but this is the ultimate one because this depicted that final sacrifice for sin. We don't need another altar. The cross is our ultimate altar. That's the ultimate one. The sacrifice lamb, that's it. And I think that's why we don't see, because many a time we saw Abraham dedicating this area to his God, worshiping his God, and he will never hear again, all the way through the rest of his life, that he built an altar. I'm not telling you he didn't, but we don't get the picture of it. We're not told of it. Um, and again, the, the offering was offered in the place or instead of as a substitution, the same way Yeshua Jesus it is the substitute for us, that he died in our place. Is this where um, Christ was crucified on this same? Yes. Mount Moriah, the, on the, the mountains of Moriah, Golgotha is one of those mountains, yes. Okay, but this is where the temple was built. There are those who say that Moriah, where Abraham offered up Yitzhak, is where the temple was. There are others who say it's where Golgotha, the, the, the sacrifice, was. Whichever is right, it's the same mountain range. Um, I kind of tend to think the picture seems to me to be perfect for it to be, this is where Golgotha was, but I can't be dogmatic. And even if it is the temple, it's still the mercy seat in the temple that the blood was placed on that Yeshua took and put his blood on the heavenly mercy seat for our salvation. So either way, whether it's a picture where the temple was that represented God coming and dwelling with man and being one with man through shed blood, or whether it was where the sacrifice took place. Either way, it's a beautiful picture. So was, in, was uh, Abraham in Jerusalem when they left? He, when he left to take his son to Mount Moriah? No, he came from I think it was Beersheba where he came from, or does he return? Um, I think it was Beersheba. Uh, Hang on just a second, because he, we have a change of address for him. And did he have a GPS? <laughs> yes, God's <laughs> protective <laughs> services. <laughs> uh, and I'm not quite, I've got some more, and that is good, I've got time. I'm looking, I've got to get all the way to the end of the it's, chapter. It's 31, therefore he called this place Beresheba. Okay. There's two of them. Okay. He went from Moriah to Beersheba. So it's not that he left Beersheba. Um, he was living in... Uh, oh, come on, Michelle. Oh, thank you, Roger. Um, where was it? it? It's all right. It'll come back to me. I'm trying too hard because I studied all of this. and uh, But it'll come back to me. But he, was, he wasn't in, I don't think, just Jerusalem. He was, well, he it was a three-day journey, remember? Right. Yeah, so, Hebron, Hebron, thank you. Okay, we're going to see that he's living at one point at Hebron, Hebron, as you say, and at another time at Beersheba. Hebron and Beersheba are about 20 miles apart, about a Sabbath day's journey apart. H-E-B-R-O-N. Uh-huh, yeah. Beersheba is south of Hebron, okay? Uh, that was dumb of me because it was... If no, he was no. in Jerusalem, he'd have been right outside. Exactly, it would have been right uh, there. But what you were doing is you're relating. I know Yeshua, Jesus died outside the gate of Jerusalem, so you are relating, and you are right. And when you look at the, if I could bring back those pictures of that Temple Mount area that we looked at, you saw how it's mountainous. You know, it's not like we've got 
divisions and, and you know where you can see but you saw the Kidron Valley you saw how it was a mountain plateau here's the temple you go further out from that on that mountainous hilly area you come to Golgotha because Golgotha and the temple are not that far from each other right you know they're, they're in close succession to each other and then the garden tomb is right in that area too and that's actually, what helps you when you go to Israel you see how close everything is and actually the map of Abraham I don't know uh, um, the migration of Abraham. I don't know that would help. I don't think that will right now. You know, I know what I know what you're showing, but I don't think it will help right now. Yeah, in fact, for one thing, I'd have to get my little eye helpers out to see all the the different areas. But see, we don't know. It, it, I'll I'll go back and I'll <coughs> tell you exactly where he was. Um, but he was three days journey from. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. thank well, you. Though. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I know, but I, I want to say, I want to say he was, uh, let me just wait till my mind catches up with scripture. I'll come back with the answer next week if I don't get it before class is over. But I want us to see something else because when we have, again, this emphasis that he was in the place of, okay, notice we're going to have this really emphasized um, in our next verse, okay? Mm -hmm. The, the ram was offered as a burnt offering in the place of his son, in the stead of, it, it, you might have in your scripture, the perfect picture of the substitution. Now notice verse 14. Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Now if you read that in English, you're going to say, great, the Lord provided, and you're going to stop right there and you're going to miss so much more. Because what we see there, when I say the Lord will provide, does anyone remember how we say it in our Hebrew? Rowena, you're muted. Can you help her? I know she's Jehovah Jireh. Very good. Okay, you say Jehovah Jireh. Forgive me when I say Jehovah Yireh because it's just, you know, closer to the Hebrew. But just realize Jehovah Jireh. You even know the song that the Lord has provided. That's what we have here. When it says the name of the place the Lord will provide, if in the Hebrew it says the name of the place, Jehovah Yireh, Jehovah Jireh. Now, when we look at that in the Hebrew, that can literally mean the Lord will be seen or the Lord sees. We saw this earlier when we talked about it in relation to Hagar, but we're going to see it even more here. <laughs> okay. The earlier in verse 8, we, we had God will provide for himself. Okay. That's the same thing. We're talking about the same thing, verse 8 and verse 14. So 8, Abraham was saying God will. 14, he's saying God did in essence. Okay. We have the same thing, but when we have a compound name of our God, two names put together, Jehovah was something else. When we have those compound names, we see God in his redemptive um, relationship to mankind. How is God redeeming mankind in this picture is a perfect picture through the sacrifice blood through taking our place in death for us and of course coming back to life by passing through this trial we see what God does for us we get that understanding um, but we understand it okay I'm saying this so poorly I had it so much better in my mind last night um, it's only on the grounds of the sacrifice of the Son, okay? That, that's what provides salvation for us. And that's what this name is telling us. On the provision of God, on the, the sacrifice of His Son, that's how this was provided for us. And why does it say uh, the Lord sees? We would say the Lord will see to it. That's the way it's meaning it. That the Lord's going to take care of it all. If I told you, okay, I will see to it, that means you release, you let go, and I take care of it. That's what Abraham is showing. He didn't do anything. God did it all. God did the complete sacrifice. He's the one that that gave completely. Um, I'm just, I'm fumbling. Forgive me for fumbling. My mind today, Lord help me. <laughs> um, 
I, I, what I want you to see is how, again, that double play. God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb. He as is the lamb. lamb. As a lamb. As a lamb. And, you know, God will provide. God's going to take care of it. And it's also saying God will be what takes care of it. God will be the lamb. It's both ways in our Hebrew. And when we look at Jehovah Yira, we see that same thing. That we're coming to the one who is the provider and the provision. How's that? That works. He's provider and he's provision. Now, if I say he's provision, you ask me, well, what does that mean? What, what do you mean provision? <laughs> okay, I'll give you a good example because I figure somebody asked me, all right? You're going to go on a trip. You're going to get the provisions necessary to go on that trip. Now, you can get everything you want for that trip from... Twinkies <laughs> to to a good you know balanced meal once again okay to what you really need to sustain you you're gonna take you know water and you're going to take protein and you're going to take everything that you need okay that's provisions that are dependent for life that's what God's saying here what's well, a matter of life I'm providing it all that without this apart from this there is loss of life. With this, there is life. That's what he's saying in his name. I'll provide it all. And he provides it by providing himself. Remember when I said God provided God? He provided it all himself. At this point in time, he's been asking Abraham, give up your son. Not just anyone, not just anything, but the son of promise, the son that brought laughter and joy into his life, yes, but this is the son of promise for the future. So, Abraham, everything that's going to provide for your future, I want you to give that up. I want you to sacrifice that. That's what he's saying. And then he tells him how he's going to provide himself. He told him, go, take your only son, Abraham goes, he builds the altar, he puts, you know, everything, the wood on the altar, lays the sun on the altar. He, we see his faith as we've already talked about. And when all of this is done, and Abraham's seeing this whole picture, he puts that name on it. The Lord provides. The Lord is the provision. Yehovah Yira. This is where he is saying, it's all taken care of. And then he says, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. That's where I'll use that word seen. When the Lord sees to it, on the mountain of Adonai, it is seen. Now hold on to that, and let's go back to Golgotha, being the possible place that we're talking about. We're at least on the mountain range of Golgotha. Where could they see his provision? It was right there. To me, that's a whole nother layer that the Lord is showing us in this symbolism. That's why he told Abraham, you go to the place I've picked. You go to the place I'll tell you. And when they even got close, it was now go up on the mountain. I do believe. It, in my heart, my mind right now, I'm convinced it's Golgotha. I don't have any problem with the temple, but I just see it one more little detail right there. Abraham prophetically saying, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be seen. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. On the mountain of the Lord, God provides God. Wow, wow. And when we realize later, the Temple Mount is called the mountain of the Lord. Maybe that's why I have to back up and say, okay, now I can see it being where the temple is. Because the Temple Mount is called the Mountain of the Lord. They'll go up to the Mountain of the Lord in the Millennium to worship Him, to bring their sacrifices of praise to Him. So I see it in both ways. And I think it's very fitting that both are on the same mountain range. So I guess I'm going to tell you it's too big that He can find a one little pinpointed spot. <laughs> and we can ask God one day, where was Abraham? Here or here? <laughs> but we're on that same mountain range. And was that the burning bush also on that same mountain with Moses? No, no, that was not in the same area. That would be cool, but it wasn't. <laughs> so hot, but not that hot. <laughs> um, no, uh, Moshe was down in Mount Sinai area. It wasn't the same mountain range. So, 
Uh, but Abraham had faith in God's provisions. Now, a lot of people will mistake that too, and they'll think this is the waiter syndrome, I'll call it. You know, when you go to a restaurant, you've got a waiter. Waiter, you know, I want a glass of water. Waiter, bring me my dessert. Waiter, bring me my check. They're thinking of in that way. But I think the better is the answer, wait, or wait on God. That's what we're seeing. God's provision is not at the snap of our fingers. God's provision is in His way, in His perfect timing, Amen. and how He chooses to do it. Amen. Abraham could have orchestrated this, and he couldn't have thunk this up on his own either. We know God was directing him. And when we see the full meaning of the Lord shall provide, we're going to quit snapping our fingers, Lord, I need this, Lord, I need that, Lord, give it to me now. We're going to say, Lord God, whatever I need, you will provide. Let me wait on you till you do provide. Remember, Abraham went in the timing of the Lord. That ram that got caught in that thicket, you think he was there the day before? No. You think he would have been there the day after? But it was there right when the need was, the time is perfect. God seldom early, never late, always on time. And then you can hear that little poem, and I grew up hearing it, so I love it. Overheard in an orchard, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why those anxious human beings rush about and worry so, <laughs> said the sparrow to the robin. Friend, I think it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. <laughs> it's a mouthful, isn't it? Matthew 10, Matthew 10, chapter 29, chapter 10, verses 29 to 31 tells us he even knows when a sparrow falls. He values you more than the sparrow. He will provide exactly what you need. Let me tell you about our awesome and amazing God that gives us what we need. And because I'm telling you in the vernacular of the birds, I'm going to keep it there. I love the lesson that we'll learn from the woodpecker. I don't know if you know how wonderfully and fearfully the woodpecker is made. Let me tell you, okay? He has a beak that's long enough that he can peck into the trunk of that tree to that insect that he knows is inside that bark. Y'all know that's why the woodpecker pecks? He's packing to get through to that insect that he knows that that's food for him. That's his meal. And he packs with precision like a drill. You know, you've all heard it. You all know it. And he doesn't miss. He doesn't build this huge hole. He zeroes in. He's going to get to that insect. Now, can that bug run? <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's trapped in the tree. <laughs> Sorry, it's going to be the meal till we get on the other side of that curse of sin. <laughs> But that woodpecker has a spring-like mechanism in his neck. The speed, the duration that that woodpecker pecks at, if he didn't have that spring in his neck, he would break his neck. He'd lose his life the first time he pecked for a meal. His head, his neck couldn't sustain it. But God gave him a spring-like mechanism. <laughs> So, our woodpecker has now made it into the insect. Sorry, insects. Sorry, insect lovers. The woodpecker now, I love this, and I have to keep reading my notes so I don't miss any detail. That woodpecker's tongue, you know where the tongue's been? <laughs> Think about a woodpecker. <laughs> Roger knows. The woodpecker has a beak, okay? He doesn't have a mouth with a tongue sitting there like we do. He's got a beak. His tongue's been curled up in the top part of his head. That's where the tongue is. Oh now, when he gets into that insect, the tongue rolls out, zips in, zoop, gets that insect. That was delicious. And the tongue goes back up into the head, rolls back up. If the tongue stayed down in the mouth in that area, the woodpecker would suffocate. He wouldn't be able to get the air intake he needs. So. He retracts, the tongue goes back up, he's had his meal. That's the woodpecker. That. <laughs> now, God knew the woodpecker needed that drill, needed the tongue stored somewhere else, needed to be able to function in this capacity so the woodpecker could get a meal and keep growing, keep living. But that peak 
must be real strong because to pack on that wood. That wood has to be very strong. Oh, and you never see an old woodpecker with a dull beak. <laughs> they don't wear down. <laughs> That's amazing too, is it not? Our God is awesome. He is amazing. And if you haven't heard me before, I'll take you to the pigeon also and the pigeon walk. The pigeon walk's funny. We all know that. You see the all, you know, funny gait. Well, they can't see where they're going. They have to stop allow their eyes to focus, look around, and then they see where to take the next step. And they do this all very quickly, but that's why they walk funny, because they're stopping, their eyes have to stop spinning, so to speak, their head comes to a complete stop, they see, and then they take the next step. And that makes it clumsy, but it makes them able to take the, the next step. That's the pigeon. Oh that's the pigeon. Now, we've got the same master designer. He has made us fearfully and wonderfully. He provides for us. So when we see Abraham's steps revealing his great faith, we see we need to be just like Abraham. Immediately respond. Okay, God, you're providing. You'll take care of. You'll do whatever you call me to do. I need to do. I don't need to argue it with you. I don't need to bargain with you. I don't need to question what if. I don't need to say, but I need whatever we need to just immediately, as it said, early in the morning, he saddled his donkey, took his two young men, together with Yitzhak, he cut the wood for the burnt offering, he departed, and he went to the place God had told him about. That was verse 3. He obeyed without wavering. He obeyed by acting out on his faith. He trusted his God. And that's the point I'm trying to drive home tonight. He trusted his God. And he knew, because he knew he, by trusting, where is it, it's verse 18, um, when, earlier, when he offered up his son, his only son, to whom it had been said, what is called your seed will be in Yitzhak. He knew this is that one that's going to have the seed. He concluded, as I already said, that God could even bring Yitzhak back from the dead if that's what was necessary. God would provide, and God did provide. He saved this, the, this promised son from being a sacrifice, and at the same time, he gave him his whole self when it was his time. But he did preserve his promise to make out of Yitzhak a great nation and the seed that would come from. And that's where we go on and see Jehovah Yerah provided for us. What was promised? Let me bring it in the vernacular that we see again. Um, well, it's not exactly the birds, but it's close. Let me just read for you. This is Matthew 6, I think. I'm looking for my reference. You'll recognize it. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds. Here we go. Look at the birds flying about. They neither plant nor harvest, nor do they gather food into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they are? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to his life? And why be anxious about clothing? Think about the fields of wild irises and how they grow. They neither work nor spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Shlomo, Solomon, in all his glory, was clothed as beautifully as one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass in the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown in an oven, won't he much more clothe you? What little trust you have. So don't be anxious asking, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or how will we be clothed? For it's the pagans who set all their hearts on all those things. Your Heavenly Father knows you need them all, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble already. What's our issue? Out of what we're seeing, out of God provided a ram in the middle of a mountain at the precise moment that Abraham's there, ready to offer his son. He didn't say, wait an hour, you'll, you'll find something. He didn't say, go look for the ram. He provided everything. And that's the example that we see all the way through all of this, all of this creation that I've been talking about. He clothes and he feeds the birds. 
He has his eye on them. He's given them what they need. He's made them so that they can live. We were created in his image. We are created fearfully and wonderfully. And like Matthew 7 says, doesn't God know how to give good gifts to his children? If you're going to ask for bread, is he going to give you a stone? If you ask for a fish, is he going to give you a snake? No, he's going to give you what you need. So ask, seek, knock, but expect. Trust and expect. The how and the where, that's, uh, or the when, I'm sorry, the how and the when, that's up to God. But it gives us no room to worry. We are really doing a, dis a disservice to our God when we worry. And that's what I want to hit us on. I know we're coming up to closing time, but we spend so much time in anxiousness, anxieties, worries, concerns, and every time it really is, in my mind right now, is almost like a slap in the face of God. God who is taking care of the woodpecker, God who's taking care of that pigeon, God who takes care of the flowers in the field, who made you in his own image, who comes into your life in an intimate and personal way, and you really want to worry about your need? Really? Really? You really don't want to just say, as Abraham did, I'm going to trust you even if I can't understand? God provided God. He doesn't stop short. He gives everything that he needs. And I love that poem, Why God Gave Us a Savior. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, and God sent us a Savior. That same one who sent his Savior, how can you worry about whatever it is you fill in the blank? How can you do that? He didn't spare his son. Where's he going to stop short? His love is so great that this is the same one, Hagar said it when she said he's Elroy, the God who sees me. Remember, the Lord will provide, the Lord, it, it will be seen, or the Lord sees. Here it is, the God who sees me. So I take you in this lifetime that we've got right here from his names, Elroy, Yehovah Yera. What's the other one we did today? We did another one earlier. Oh my God, oh, Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord. Even in just those names, do you not see our God is an awesome God, faithful and wonderful and perfect to know and to meet your need. Wherever you are in your journey, whatever you're asking, can you really put a question mark at the end of anything? How can we do that? How can we do that? I won't sing it for you, but think about his eyes on the sparrow, and I know that he sees me, or watches me. Watching is even more than see. It's a continual eye. The Lord has his eye on you. The Lord had his eye on Abraham. I know I'm preaching to a choir, but sometimes the choir needs to be encouraged, needs to be reassured, needs to be firmed up in our faith. We need to strengthen one another. But I'm really going to challenge you along with myself this week not to allow one moment of worry or flurry to enter into my thoughts because my God deserves better out of me than that. I want the faith of Abraham. I want to say, even if it's sacrificing on the altar, the nearest and dearest to my heart, I know it's okay because God will take care of it and God will provide and God will do whatever it is that we need in a greater way than we can even think or imagine. That's our God. That's our awesome God. Um, I'm deciding where I go right here, how far I go before I close us off, whether I go into our next thought or stop on time today. Um, let me just, yeah, let me, let me go just a tiny, tiny bit 
further because I think it mentions it. No, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I need to just wait here and just let us end on this thought of God's faithfulness, his provision. What a picture. Again, reminding us this is the first time love is mentioned in Scripture. What a picture of love. You will never find another one. I know what I need to say because it's in verse 14. The, that the Lord will provide, as it is said, to this day. When that was written, it probably was when Moses was recording. He's, he's the one that you know compiles all the books, the first five books, and it's his name that's given authorship to the books. But we know that, that from the way the Hebrew wrote it, that there's room that there were compilings that were given to him. Like Adam passed down parts that were from him, and others passed down parts that were from them. And then Moses finally is, is the one that God used to put it all together, put a backbone on it, and it becomes fully every word inspired by God. So when he put in to this day, he's adding in, it wasn't just an Abraham's day, all the way to this day, the Lord provides. If we were writing scripture today, we'd put in our footnote and we'd say, all the way to May 31st, 2023, the Lord provides. The Lord is faithful. It's not cut short. And if I even told you from Moses, he's the seventh generation from Avraham. We're going to have Avraham begat, 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 and finally begats Moses. Seven generations, seven being complete and the perfect number of God. Um, Avraham is the fourth from Levi. Okay, Levi was the third from Abraham. This is how we get it. But my point is here, there's going to be over 600 years in just this time when Moshe inserts his commentary, so to speak, but inspired by God and says the Lord will provide. 600 years later, Moshe wasn't saying, oh, well, that was isolated. That was the highlight. Those people got something from God we don't get today. And I'm telling you, how many hundreds, thousands of years since Moshe, we can say the same thing. We want to be the testimony of the Lord, a testimony for the Lord on the mountain of the Lord. It will be provided. How did this mountain get to be called the mountain of the Lord? It got named right here. It's from Bereshit 22. That later, the temple, as I said, when David, David buys the house for the Lord, the temple is built there. It's the place that he chose, and we'll close with this reference. Um, in fact, I'll stop right here because this is where I'll pick it up next week. I will show you how that area is called the mountain of the Lord. But it started all the way back here when God gave it its name, and he gave it when he gave us the first and most complete and beautiful picture of his love where God provided God. He did it all. Jehovah Yera. He is the one who sees to it. He is the one who is seen. He is the one who provides. And he is the very provision. Wow, what a God. And we think we're going to put a handle on Malach Adonai and Malach Yehovah. It's beyond our comprehension, is it not? I think this is a great place for us to end today, to end on a faith-building note of how amazing our God is, how beyond our thoughts, how beyond our understanding, and let us just bask in that and then carry that with you this week. And as soon as that worry wants to enter, you call out, No, I've got Jehovah Europe for my God. I've got the angel of the Lord who sees and provides. I've got El Roy, the God who sees. No matter what's going on, he's seeing, he knows, he's providing, and it's him. It's him. What more do you need? You've got him. And I love it. As my brother would say, he's got this. <laughs> so let's close in a word of prayer. On that note, open up the mics. I hope it's a blessing to you to, to just, like I say, sometimes we just need to be refreshed in, in our great God. And that's, that's what I hear, how great is our God. If I could sing all the songs that are going through my mind. Hallelujah, Lord, I'll praise you with my voice, with my joyful noise, and I will thank you that you are the great provider, that you have provided everything you've provided yourself. You are the Lamb of God. You have taken away our sin. You have given us eternal life, but you have also entered into our life 
every moment of every day, seeing our needs, providing, even going ahead and bringing the provision to us. Lord, let us walk in our faith as greatly as we see Abraham did in this lesson today. Let us not allow worry, confusion, anything to enter and trouble our minds, but let us fully trust, fully walk in our faith, fully please you, fully be obedient, and see you fully at work to take care of whatever could have even begun to concern us. Thank you that you are so awesome and amazing that you can take care of any and every need and you can even do it for each one of us at the same moment in time and someone else on the other side of the world. You are an awesome God. You are worthy of our praise and we thank you, Yehovah Yira, our provider. In the holy name of Yeshua Jesus, Amen. 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 I had to keep thinking, be anxious for nothing. Yes. And everything, like prayer and supplication. Yes, and perfect verse. Can you say it loud, Anne, so they can hear while Roger's unmuting them? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and my dad would add in two little words, and I said he's the only one, the only time I've ever felt like, yeah, that could be added into Scripture, when it says um, in the end that, um, okay, Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatsoever no, no, is honest. No, no, no. Back up, back up. Give me verse 7. Rejoice. Oh, <laughs> 4 to 6. Seven, rejoice verse in seven. the Lord always. When it and says, okay, say, let me look it up because she's going on. She's saying all kinds of verses. But the two words he'd add in are in Philippians 4 and it'll be verse 7 where it says, as soon as I can jump in, I'll have it. Um, the peace of God which passes all understanding. He would add in and misunderstanding. When oh, I understand or misunderstand, he passes beyond all of that and keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I, I remember saying to my dad, okay, I give you two inerrant words in your life. <laughs> it fits. Understanding and misunderstanding.